Today we'll be starting chapter four, which is on differentiation rules. You've noticed that taking a derivative by definition using the limit definition of derivative is very labor intensive. So we will spend some time trying to develop rules that will allow for this process to be much more efficient. So first of all, let's start with a little bit of notation. If the function is y equals f of x, then we have y prime or f prime or df by dx or df by dx, but with an f more separated. Um, these two notations will be useful when the function's independent variable is very clearly stated and understood, um, whereas these other two notations have a big advantage of specifically stating what the independent variable here is, right? So this is specifically saying that you're taking a derivative of f with respect to x, not time, not something else, but x in particular. Okay, so these two last notations will be very useful in word problems that we'll see later today, um, as well as much later in applications like related rates. So first of all, let's take the simplest possible function we can think of, which is a constant function. So what if my function is just y equals seven? No matter what value for x I pick, y is always seven. Let's think about that as a graph. What does y equals seven look like? Well, y equals seven is a line, and in fact, it's a horizontal line. There it is. Graphically, the derivative is a slope of a tangent line to our graph. Here, it doesn't matter what point x I pick, the tangent line is the line itself, and the derivative is a slope of that line, which in this case is zero. So, since it doesn't matter what c is, so if c is eight or six or whatever, it's always a horizontal line, a slope of a horizontal line will always be zero. So the derivative of a constant is always zero. Excellent. The second one is a power rule. Now this one I'm not going to um, derive by, from the definition, but this is where all the derivative rules come from. So what you should do is plug this into the limit definition of the derivative, simplify, open up the brackets, cancel out um, things that you can cancel out, compute the limit, and you will get the actual um, result. I'm not going to go through all this algebra, but I will give you the final result for the power rule, which is telling us how to compute derivatives of power functions. So anything x to power any n, um, this rule will work for. So the rule is that the power actually comes down to the front and gets reduced by one. And this is true for all powers n. And it's truly true, this is the best rule because it's true for all powers n. n can be integers, n can be fractional powers, n can be negative. No matter what power I have here, the derivative of it can be taken using the power rule. The power rule is really powerful. Now, let's take a look at the next two. So the next two are sum and difference rule. Um, the difference rule will work the same way, but with a minus in between. So the sum and difference rule tell us that in order to take a derivative of two summons, f plus g, I can just take derivatives of them separately. Okay, and the reason this works, again, you can derive it purely from the definition. I am going to motivate it a little bit from the graph and a little bit from algebra. The idea is, if I, let's say, have two functions, f of x and g of x, their sum is x's don't change, right? So if I were to compute the point on the graph that corresponds, for example, to this value of x, let me put the value here, right? What I would do is just add up the y values for my two functions. So this is just about just above two, and this is a little bit higher. So I will get something like five. So the point on my f plus g graph will be a point here. If I pick another value of x, I go through the exact same process of just adding up the height of f plus the height of g, okay? So if I do this a little more carefully, I'm going to get a function just like this one, f plus g. And then remember that the derivative in its essence, is just rise over run. It's just I'm taking the run over really, really small, um, small segment, okay? So for the derivative of f plus g, it's going to be rise, however much I manage to rise, over some fixed run. If I pick two points here, the x values here and here, Notice that my x segment doesn't change. So the run for all of these functions is the same, 
but the rise is different. And the rise for f plus g is composed of the rise of f plus the rise of g. So I can break up this function over the denominator and I'm going to end up with rise over round of f plus rise over round of g, which means I have a separate derivative of f and a separate derivative of g. The other way to write this rule, just to practice a little bit with notation, would be to say that f plus g prime is just f prime plus g prime, okay? So if I have a sum, I can split them up and compute the derivative separately. And again, the same is true for the difference. So if I have f minus g all prime, it's the same as taking the derivatives of the two functions separately, which is very handy. The constant multiple rule is another really useful uh, tool in computing derivatives. And this is just saying that if I do have some kind of constant inside my derivative, I can simply take that out and compute the derivative of only the function that is in fact dependent on x. Okay, so again, writing this in the prime notation, I will say that if I have c times f prime, I can take the constant c out and take a derivative of f only. And again, motivating this graphically just means that if I were to construct a graph here of let's say 2x, right? Nothing really happens to x's, but so let's say this is gonna be about three. So this is approximately two f of x. And then if I were to take some points on it, let's say the rise over run between these two points here and the two points on my original function, you notice that the run doesn't change. So this sort of denominator thing stays the same, but the rise now increases. So the rise over run can still be computed from the original function, but they've been now stretched out by this factor C. Okay, so these are some of the basic rules. Let's try to see how they actually apply to functions. So my favorite application on uh, estimating age of fetus growth, I showed you this formula last time. We approximated the derivative using this formula. We're now going to be able to compute it exactly using differentiation rules. So um, the first part is asking to calculate and interpret the derivative of L with respect to T, that's what this notation means, at different points in time, at 15, 20, and 30 weeks. Great, so this is my function L. It might be useful to just highlight where the actual variables occur, so the function's real nature stands out a little bit more. The function itself is just a cubic polynomial. Okay, so let's take a derivative of this thing. So first of all, I'm going to take the derivative of L with respect to time, that's where this notation is useful, it tells me very clearly what I'm taking in the derivative of with respect to what. And it's also telling me very clearly what the units should be, because the top is the units of L, which are in millimeters, and the bottom are the units of T, which are in weeks. So my answer will be in millimeters per week. Fantastic. Okay, so the other way to write this is, of course, to say this is L prime of T, and the verbal description of this would be that this is the rate of growth of the fetus, of the femur, I guess I can be more specific. Okay, so these are all the possible descriptions of this derivative here without the graphical one because we don't actually have the graph here. Fantastic. So I'm gonna take a derivative of this. I'm gonna do it very slowly because it's the first example we're doing. So the very first thing I'm going to do is just to rewrite the entire thing there it is, and I'm taking the derivative of it. So I'm gonna use the prime notation. So this whole thing prime. Now, the first thing to note here is that it's actually three separate pieces with a plus and minus in between and the derivative of that. So the sum and difference rule suggest that I can break this all apart and take derivatives of the separate pieces themselves, okay? So the very first thing I can do here is just to say, let me move this out. It's just to say, okay, so this is the same as taking the derivative of the very first piece plus taking the derivative of the second piece minus taking the derivative of the third piece. Okay, and this is already much better because now everything's a little more comp compartmentalized. Okay, so now let's go through these one at a time. So this first thing that I'm taking a derivative of is just a constant. And remember, we just talked about a couple of slides ago, a derivative of a constant 
it's just zero. So this is just zero. Plus, now let's take a look at this guy. So this is a constant times t. Going back to this slide, it says that if I have a constant times a function that I'm taking a derivative of, I can just take a constant out and take a derivative of just the function, okay? So this again will simplify things quite a bit. I'm gonna take out the constant 3.71 and take a derivative of just my function, my function being just t. Great, here it's the same thing. This whole thing is just a constant. So I can leave it alone or take it out, whichever way you prefer to think about this. And all I need to do is take a derivative of t cubed. That's fantastic news. The reason this is particularly great news is because the two things I have to take a derivative of are both functions uh, that are power functions, t to power one, and this guy is t to power three. So I can apply my power rule. Remember the power rule says that the power comes down and gets reduced by one. Okay, so what am I gonna have here? So this is equal to 3.71. The power comes down, which is one, and gets reduced by one down to zero. Great, now here I'm going to leave my ugly um, constant and take a derivative of t cubed. So the power three comes down and it gets reduced by one to t squared. And that's it, I'm done here, I can do a little bit more simplifying because I can notice that t to power zero, anything to power zero is just one. So this guy is actually just one. So in fact, the derivative of t is just one. So all together here, I'm going to have 3.71 minus 6.33 times 10 to the negative four times three t squared. And this is my derivative. Now that I've computed the derivative, let's get to the rest of this question, which is asking to not just compute the derivative for any value of t, but rather to figure out what are the exact numbers for 15, 20, and 30 weeks, okay? So here's my derivative, um, same as the one on the previous slide, that's where I got this from. I have to compute this at these three different points. The notation for that, so if I had, if I had labeled this L prime of t, then what it's asking me to compute is L prime of 15, L prime of 20 and L prime of 30. But just so we're a little uh, more used to this uh, DL by DT notation, um, the way we denote it there will be DL by DT and I have to compute it at T equals 15. So you do a really tall vertical bar and then you write what point you're computing this at afterwards. And then I also have to compute this at 20 and at 30. Now, of course, the computational part is really straightforward because all I am doing is plugging um, 15, 20, and 30 into this derivative function, and I'm just getting a number answer in the end, okay? So my numbers here, once I plug them in, would be 3.28, 2.95, and 2.00, okay? Now, again, thinking back to units, this is where this notation is much more useful because this is saying these are the units of L over the units of T. So the units of L were millimeters, the units of T were weeks. So all of these have millimeters per week. Okay, fantastic. And part two of the question asks, does the rate of growth of a fetus increase or decrease with age? Okay, and we can see that the numbers are all positive, which means that the rate of growth is positive. So the fetus femur continues to in fact grow. However, first it grows pretty quickly and then it grows a little bit slower because the numbers are smaller and then it grows slower still. So it continues to grow, but, it's grow the, but the rate of growth slows down. Okay, so for part two of the question, we can say that um, continues to grow but slower. Next up, let's talk about product rule. So we've seen how we can take derivatives of um, functions that are added together with constants, but what about two functions that are multiplied together? Okay, so here's um, 
what would have happened if the product rule was the same as the sum of quotient rule. So if I have the product of two functions, is that true that it's the, the derivative is the same as the product of the derivatives? Probably not if we're talking about this. So let's think about what a prior can represent geometrically. If I say things like three times five, how can you actually picture it visually? Um, three times five means, let's say I took a plot of land, three meters by five meters, and then three times five describes the entire area of that plot. So in this case, it's very useful to think about F times G as the actual area. So let's say I have myself a, uh, some sort of rectangle in dimensions of f by g and then in the sort of derivative manner the whole point is that things are changing it starts to grow in each dimension and the question really is how did those dimension changes influence the areas change okay so this isn't going to be by any means a very rigorous argument for the product rule. Um, in fact, it's gonna be quite hand wavy, but I'm just trying to give you some motivation and some intuition for what it is without really going into the very tedious computations, okay? So the idea is more or less that as the dimension of F changed, let's call this tiny little addition to it F prime. So it increased by some amount F prime, right? So this, length here is f prime and on the g side we can think of that as a small change in g so g prime okay and now let's think about what are the areas so this area is still f times g because it's length times width now what about the area of this little rectangle well the length times width here now the width is f prime and the length is still g right so this guy is f prime g and the same logic applies to this little rectangle where the width is still f, but the length now is g prime. So this guy is f times g prime, whereas this little corner guy is f prime g prime. Now, if my changes were teeny tiny, like they're supposed to be when I'm talking about derivatives because the limit is supposed to go to zero, this little corner here, I'm multiplying a teeny tiny number by another teeny tiny number. So this corner here can essentially be negligible. Negligible. And so what the area has changed by, so what has been the change in my overall area? Well, my area used to be that, and now it's this whole thing and I'm counting this as negligible. So the change that I've introduced is the area of the two red rectangles, which are F prime G and F G prime. Okay, now once again, this is by no means a rigorous argument, but this is just to remind you that the product rule is not as easy as just multiply, as just sort of distributing the derivatives in. Product rule talks about a different dimensions of function change. So it's going to be quite a bit more complicated than the sum and product rule that we've seen before, okay? So in product rule, if I have f times g, then I have to first take a derivative of the function f, leave g alone, and then leave f alone, take the derivative of g. Let's see how that works in an example. So here's our first one, find the derivative of 3x times x plus one. Okay, so here it's a clear product rule. This is my first function, let's call it f, and this is my second function, let's call it g. So the product rule says I'm going to take a derivative of the first function first, so 3x prime, and leave the second one b, plus I'm going to leave the first one alone and take a derivative of the second one. Okay, so this is just what the first step of the product rule will give me. Now we actually have to go ahead and take those derivatives. So what is the derivative of 3x? Well, the constant I can just leave, and then I have to take a derivative of x, which is just one. It's one times x to power zero, which is just one, and then times this x plus one bracket, and then I have 3x, and now I need to take a derivative of x plus one. Now, once I have a sum, I can take a derivative of each one of them separately. So it's a derivative of x plus a derivative of one. Okay, let me write this out for one more time. So this is three x plus one plus three x. The derivative of x is once again, just one. 
the derivative of one, one is a constant, so it's zero, okay? I can open up the brackets now and simplify this. That will be fine too, so three x plus three plus three x, so overall I get six x plus three, and that's my final answer for the derivative, okay? So this is how one applies the product rule. I strongly encourage you to actually open up the brackets of this thing and do it the different way, just to practice a little bit more um, with the other differentiation rules.